much for coming tonight. Welcome to Survey Monkey. How awesome is this space? The reason that we do these is to give women the opportunity to get up on stage and talk about being awesome rather than talking about being women. Um, I'm Robin Ducat, I'm the CTO of Survey Monkey, and we've got a great set of talks tonight. You're having a conversation with a very specific purpose at massive scale. So I'm gonna give you a couple of tips on how to make sure that your surveys are gonna yield the highest quality data because it's a little bit of art and it's a little bit of science. So we're gonna talk about designing uh, for carbon-based life forms, which is us, people. Data becomes human readable when through the power of design, we wrap that data in meaning. When design transforms data into story, that's when the magic happens. And today I'm very excited to share with all of you our journey of transforming SurveyMonkey's front end with GraphQL. Can you talk about your journey and what were your pivotal moments when you look back now? You said, okay, this, is, this was a game changer. Everybody's got a certain set of strengths and weaknesses, right? And so over the years, developing a career around my strengths and then hiring for my weaknesses. Do not accept a job that meets any less than two of your three criteria. That we all should have, and the willingness to learn new things, and the courage to actually take on new challenge. You can be the smartest person and the most talented person in the room, but if they, people can't rely on you, they're, long term they're not going to want you to be on their team. For you to be successful, if you aren't really engaged in what you're doing, you're just not going to be excited about putting the effort in that it really takes to make a success of yourself. What if you like what you're doing, but you just don't like the people you're working with? <laughs> Get a new job. <laughs> yes, we got recruiting over there. <laughs> <laughs> My life is too short. Hi everyone, I'm Gretchen. I'm with Girl Geek X. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Welcome to Survey Monkey. How awesome is this space? It's so good. I love it. I love it. Also, I'm going to introduce a unicorn in one second after I do my little spiel. <laughs> Spiel. 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 Okay, so how many first Girl Geek dinner? A lot. Okay, so welcome. We do these every week. We've been doing them for 10 years. We've done like 250 of them so far. Uh, we also record them. They're on YouTube. We do a podcast. It's in the podcast places. So definitely check those out. Um, but something we were talking about a little earlier, I was thinking... Um, the reason that we do these is to give women the opportunity to get up on stage and talk about being awesome rather than talking about being women. So one thing I'll challenge you guys with is find yourself a woke male and bring him next time because there's nothing gendered about this content and building allyship is a really good thing. All right, so without further ado, I know I'm going to get comments on this way. I can't wait to hear what the feedback is, so send it my way. I'm ready. Okay, so now. Hello. Hi. So I don't know if you've ever met a female CTO live and in person, but you're about to. And she's amazing. In the like three minutes, we've just decided we were separated at birth and are going to be best friends now. <laughs> Right? <laughs> we're going to get caught saying something inappropriate at least once. We know yeah, this. Yeah, we were really happy our mics were muted. Is basically <laughs> what happened. Okay, so without further ado, please welcome the CTO of Survey Monkey, Robin. Hi. Hi. Um, nice to see everybody here. I'm so glad you all could come. Um, I'm Robin Ducott. I'm the CTO of Surrey Monkey, and we've got a great set of talks tonight. Um, I guess we're just, without further ado, we're going to get started, but uh, please, at the end, we're going to be taking questions after, right after the panel, and we hope that you guys will have some interesting questions for us because we are excited to talk to you then and afterwards. All right, so why don't we get started? Yeah? You ready? So why don't I bring on, bring on stage Sarah? She is from our survey research team, and she is going to talk about surveys. Hello. Thanks. 
Uh, hi, I'm Sarah Cho. I'm director of research here at SurveyMonkey. Uh, you're probably wondering what a director of research at SurveyMonkey actually does. Um, but what we do is we uh, consult with all the different areas of the business, from product to engineering to marketing to sales, um, to give them advice on what is actually good survey best practices. So you can think of our team as basically being the biggest survey nerds, or I guess for this crowd, I should call them survey geeks. Um, at this company, uh, and of course, we can't introduce, we can't invite you to SurveyMonkey and not talk about surveys. So that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Um, is first, let's level set a little bit about what I mean by a survey. There's a lot of different things that the word survey can mean. Um, while this photo looks amazing and awesome, like I, I bet a lot of us would love to be up high on this mountaintop, and we're not talking about land surveying here. We're really talking about um, survey in questionnaire form. And what I like to kind of describe surveys as is you're having a conversation um, with a very specific purpose at massive scale. Um, so first I'm going to walk through a couple of different ways that you can do surveys, talk about the different um, types of surveys that you can conduct, and then hopefully you've been inspired that you can go home and do some surveys on your own. So I'm going to give you a couple of tips on how to make sure that your surveys are, the, are going to yield the highest quality data because it's a little bit of art and it's a little bit of science. So um, surveys, they come in many, many different shapes and sizes. Has everyone taken a survey before? Yes. <laughs> um, it could be on the phone. So these are like the surveys they call you when you're sitting down at dinner and you're right about to take your first bite of food and they're like, hey, will you take a survey? Um, or it could come in person. Maybe it's someone who's knocking on your door or maybe it's you're at the doctor's office and they're asking you a little bit about your medical history. Or increasingly, obviously, what we deal with is surveys that are online. And the great thing about online surveys is that they can be, you know, provided in a variety of different avenues. So one of the more interesting things is surveying kind of where people are working. So utilizing Slack, if you guys utilize Slack, um, and surveying people in Slack, or maybe surveying people in Facebook Messenger, really going to where the people are, rather than trying to bother them in the middle of dinner or uh, maybe, you know, in their face and knocking on their door. Uh, the beauty of surveys is that they can really be on any kind of topic. Uh, the most famous survey is probably the U.S. Census or the decennial census. So actually next year in 2020 is going to be the next census. So um, for those of you, for, well, for everyone, regardless of whether you are a citizen or not, uh, that is kind of one of those myths they tell you about the census, um, everyone needs to respond. If you don't respond, technically you could go to jail, although I wouldn't worry too much about it because they actually haven't prosecuted anyone since 1970, so it's very highly unlikely. But you know, the census is a really important survey. Things like congr uh, congressional seats, which eventually turn into who's going to be in the White House, which you know, we'll leave politics out of it. But anyways. <laughs> um, Obviously, very important decisions are made from the census. Um, but, you know, the census is a really big government. Um, surveys aren't necessarily meant for just only for big government or big business. You really can use them in many, many different contexts. So I, if you um, know me in my social life, I tend to spam you with surveys a lot, um, all for various things like organizing camping trips or for, for this screenshot, which is a little bit blurry, um, I'm trying to organize a friend's uh, birthday dinner at Beretta in San Francisco, if any of you guys have been, um, and just trying to figure out what, what to offer on the prefix menu. So very practical, very helpful. Um, another uh, good uh, way that people have utilized surveys in sort of a personal context that I haven't really shown you here in this, in this deck, but um, one of my uh, coworkers have actually utilized surveys to uh, ask people about, tell me three words about myself on how I, uh, what you think about me. So there's, there was a lot of words that came up, things like thoughtful, really considerate, um, but what was actually more uh, 
revealing in terms of thinking about her own professional development and growth is the words that weren't represented. So you can also utilize surveys for your own professional growth and development. Um, I talked a little bit about the government context, but another interesting government context is actually how you can utilize surveys to form opinions, uh, to, to sorry, gauge opinions and make changes, whether it be in the government context with this, where they were asking people who were serving in the military about what they thought about serving with a gay or a lesbian service member, and what they overwhelmingly said was that hey, actually, um, we think that regardless of whether some sex, someone's sexual orientation, I, they can effectively do their job. And that eventually was uh, evidence that Congress used to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. You see this in the workplace a lot. So a lot of organizations are asking employees about what they feel about their workplace. And employers are actually taking that information and making meaningful changes. We do that, for example, at SurveyMonkey. Obviously, we like to um, eat our own dog food or drink our own champagne, whatever the better phrase is for you guys. Um, but for example, we did um, a survey about how do people feel like they are included within our survey monkey community? Um, do they feel like they belong? And actually, because of that, we felt we found that a lot of people didn't feel like there was a good um, path to growth within the company. So we made a lot of different changes, like like having a career ladder, changing from uh, an, a yearly review cycle to a quarterly, what we call growth impact and goals um, uh, cycle. So. We're we're able to make a lot of these changes, and a lot of organizations are doing similar things. Um, and then finally, a lot of people use them for uh, market research. I like to use this example because it's a silly example, because maybe they should have used some market research here. Um, this is a product called the Euro Club. In case you're ever on the golf course, um, apparent, I don't golf myself, so maybe it's a bad example. But in case you're ever on the golf course and you need to go to a restroom um, and uh, you're, you, you, there is none available, you can utilize this golf club to uh, relieve yourself. So clearly they didn't use any market research for that. So obviously it's, it's good to use surveys to make sure that you are uh, doing well in that area. Um, so now going on to a few tips about how to create better surveys for you. Uh, so <clears throat> the first thing is questionnaire design. So you can see here, if I were to read this entire question, I would take up the rest of my 10 minute lightning talk, so I'm not going to, but you can see already visually without even reading any of the words, it's a bad question. There's a lot of words. TLDR. Um, so remember, when you're writing survey questions, surveys are super visual. Um, so if you have a huge block of text, whether it be in the questions or a lot of answer options, people don't like to read through that. Not because they're being lazy, but you know, you should really be designing with your respondents in mind. The next thing that um, I like to point out is jargon or industry terms. A lot of times we are so specialized in our industry. So in the survey industry, there's this thing called acquiescence bias. Has anyone heard of it? No. So if I asked you guys about acquiescence bias, or one person maybe, yeah. Um, most people would be like, huh, what? Um, so that's the whole point, is you shouldn't use terms that only people in your industry are, are aware of, or the worst is acronyms. So here it's, how would you rate our POS system? So has anyone worked in retail or restaurants? So you probably know what a POS system stands for. It stands for point of sale. But if you don't work in restaurant or retail, POS might mean something very different. Like, are they asking you about the toilet? Um, so, <clears throat> Instead, you should be very clear. You really want to know, how was the checkout process? So instead of using any acronyms or jargons, really stick to something that's really clear, that can be understand, understood by everyone. A good rule of thumb is uh, things are at an eighth grade reading level. That's generally a good rule of thumb for surveys. Um, so you could spend a lot of time on your questions and a lot of time looking at um, uh, your, 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 your answers. But then if you don't, sorry. <clears throat> You already got the joke, but sometimes you also need to pay attention to your response options, not just the questions themselves. So uh, this is a good example of, it's probably someone who maybe was asking about ethnicity and accidentally included Chinese and sexual orientation, but clearly that's not right. This is also a key for you guys, just to remember if you are doing surveys, always have someone else preview your survey for you because it's like writing a term paper when you're in college and you don't realize there's a typo in the first sentence of your paper that's like 20 pages long and you've read it 15 times. A lot of the times if someone else takes a look at your survey, they'll be able to point out things like this um, that you may have missed. 
Now, you could write the perfect survey with the perfect response options and then kind of bungle the data analysis. So um, in this particular example, does anyone know what might be wrong here? Yes, it adds up to more than 100. It adds up to 120, and the last time I checked, um, a close-ended question like this typically adds up to 100. So um, just make sure that you're double-checking what, what we like to call number-checking or fact-checking. Um, that is a crucial step. Another, again, sorry I'm picking on Fox News, um, but their graphics department is pretty horrible. But um, you can see here that they're showing a difference between, it looks like a really big difference, right? Like between now and January 2013, it looks really big, right? But actually it's only 4.6 percentage points. It's um, 35 to 39.6. Um, so that is actually where someone is playing with the axis um, and making a difference much more magnified than it actually is. Uh, and so this is a good example of not only things you should avoid, but other things that you can kind of see in um, when you're interpreting other people's data to see if they've kind of messed around with the interpretation of it. Um, so just to wrap up, because um, I only have around a minute left, or or actually I'm over a minute. Sorry, I don't know. I don't know how to use this timer. Um, is here are a couple of use cases that you can think about. We've talked a little bit about them, but remember you can always cut um, survey your customers, even if you don't have customers. Say you're a teacher, you have students. Survey your students. Um, you can always gain product feedback. Say you are thinking of starting your own company, but you're probably going to get very biased opinions if you ask your friends and family member. They're either going to say, "Yeah, that's a really awesome idea," because they don't want to offend you, or they're going to say, mm, "Maybe." Maybe you should stay away from that because they think you shouldn't take that risk. So always ask for feedback from people you don't know. Um, we talked a little bit about employee engagement, but there's a lot of different ways to make sure your team is happy. Um, we talked about inclusion, but there's always from the minute they step in your door as a candidate to the minute they leave um, as someone who, who is no longer an employee of your campus. Um, you can always, we like to say we want to power the curious, so satisfy curiosities, whether it's thinking about what markets you can potentially expand to, or maybe if you want to go back into academia or just put your academic hat on and just think a little esoteric about one specific problem, you can always think about what is the survey component to that. And then finally, I talked a little bit about the example about utilizing it for personal and professional growth. Um, but just to wrap up, this is just saying that even if you don't want to create your own survey, you can still help us survey nerds out there by being a respondent. So um, make sure if someone sends you a survey request, just take a few minutes out of your time, um, respond to that survey, because that's really going to help the people out who are sending it out. So I'll be here around um, in the networking hour and for Q&A. Uh, so thanks for listening. And I'm also going to now turn it over um, to Sarah on our uh, product design team. So uh, we'll, we, we'll keep it easy with the same names. <laughs> Ooh, I need to click. <laughs> you good? Hello? Hello? Ooh, hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for coming. Um, I have a slide, I promise. It's not, oh, well, I'm holding the clicker, duh. Anyway, user experience. Thanks, all. I'm a product design manager here at SurveyMonkey. Uh, and I'm here today to talk about designing data for carbon-based life forms. And what does that mean? I know, it's funny, you're laughing. It's designed to laugh. That's great. Um, so we're going to talk about designing uh, for carbon-based life forms, which is us, people. So I want you to take a moment. And just think about it. in 2019, the way we think about data has really evolved from the output of a product to kind of the product itself. And I want you to hold that in your mind for the next 10 minutes because it's really the crux of the conversation that we're going to have today. Uh, we as makers of products, whether we're designers or engineers or product managers or marketers, all play a role in defining the relationship between the product that we make and the data that it collects, creates, and disseminates into the world. And what I'd like you to walk away with is kind of a call to be more curious and more creative and more expansive in your thinking about how we define this relationship. So this is a chart. Everybody has probably seen a chart like this at some time in their life. You've probably made one. You maybe made one in elementary school. Charts and data visualizations are a very powerful way to make data, particularly uh, numeric data, visible to the human eye. 
They can also be a crutch. We can over-index on them. And I say this as a designer who's probably been guilty of this. We receive data that we're told is important for a product. Users must use this somehow. We spend a lot of time designing the container for that data. We visualize it. We make really beautiful lines, and then we kind of leave it there. We don't ask more questions. We don't curate the palette of data that we might be working with. So charts are great for making data visible, but not human readable. That requires meaning. So what's this idea of human readability? Um, I will confess I made it up, so I'll just define it for you. Data becomes human readable when, through the power of design, we wrap that data in meaning. And meaning is how we get from one, two, three to aha. That aha being how people understand how to feel about the data, how they react to the data, and how they can act with it. I want to talk a little bit about two products here that are really wonderful examples of thinking more expansively about data as a product and about making that human readable. And one of my favorite examples is Spotify. Now, Spotify is not typically what you think of when you think of a data company, but Spotify is sitting on mountains of data, millions of users, um, and all of the data associated with how they listen to music. Um, they don't surface this in the app. You probably don't want to know how many times you've replayed the Justin Timberlake song over and over and over. It probably wouldn't be good for their business model. But somebody at Spotify decided to sift through that data and thought, maybe it could become a product itself. And thus, the wrapped report was born. Um, I don't know how many people here get a wrapped report. I get a wrapped report. You got a wrapped report? Awesome. So for those of you who haven't gotten one or don't know about it, uh, what happens is at the end of the year, in this case 2018, Spotify is going to send you out this beautifully designed, curated mini site that essentially tells you the story of your year through the way you interacted with music. There's really lovely insights, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's cringeworthy, but it's really designed to share. And of course, this exploded into a phenomenon. We're posting it all over buildings, we're talking about it on the news, and of course, we're sharing it with our friends. And one of the remarkable things about this is that it wasn't successful because the data was you know, solving a really huge problem or being used in some kind of scientific theory. It was making people laugh. It was making people reflect, and it was helping them connect with each other. That's human-readable data turned into a product. And this is one of my favorite examples. So they went farther, right? They went farther, and somebody sifted through all of that data that Spotify has to come up with these advertisements that went a step further and told the story of the cultural year of 2018. Um, some of you might have had the great pleasure of seeing Shark do, 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 <laughs> a viral kids video that's, that's actually quite annoying. Um, this is just one example of this advertising campaign that they rolled out. I encourage you to look it up. They're really funny. But again, taking what is actually just a pile of data somewhere in a database and telling a story with it, making it meaningful, and having it touch people in various ways, making them laugh. Another example that might be more relevant to us in the room, those uh, you know, current product managers, designers, and engineers, or aspiring ones, uh, this is SurveyMonkey Engage. So Engage is a standalone product that we make here at SurveyMonkey. Um, it's designed to help employers connect with their employees to better understand what's going on and improve their workplace culture. Now, the data that Engage uh, collects and disseminates is almost completely numerical. So we're stuck in that position of saying, OK, well, we're going to have a lot of charts because we have to display that data, we have to display the relationships between that data, allow people to filter it, et cetera, et cetera. But what you also see in this interface are a lot of words, and that was the secret to making this data more human readable. Um, where we got to this is we decided people are changing human culture. What's important to them? It's probably not sitting around and looking at a bunch of numbers. Our users want to spend more time connecting with their employees and creating change. And numbers don't create culture change. People do. Conversations do. Relationships do. And so we thought, OK, how do we apply that to numeric data? And the secret was in what we call the core factors of engagement. We did a bunch of research, looked at all the data points we were collecting, and we saw that they grouped into conceptual chunks. And what that allowed us to do is instead of giving a bunch of data points related to how people interact in your workplace, assigned to a number of questions in a table, we wrapped it in words. That's team dynamics. 
And then we named a bunch of other areas of engagement, purpose alignment, visible future. We created language. So the focus for our users, instead of nitpicking at the data itself, which is available when you want it, you have a shared language with your employees to be able to talk about what's going on. And the data is really, the data, the numeric data displays, you know, that kind of supporting role to be able to talk about direction at a later date. So something that these two really have in common, you're probably hearing me say the word story. So it's not just meaning that we need to make data human readable, it's story. When you string meaning together, you, you really get a story. That's what a story is. And stories have been used for thousands of years for humans to be able to understand their world, their place in it, and how they can act. It provides that extra oomph. When design transforms data into story, that's when the magic happens. And the magic is that connection and action. So what I think is really important for the takeaway today is that anybody can make the magic happen. It's all about starting a conversation and providing perspectives. So I'm going to give you four steps that anybody in this room can take to start the conversation in your organization or your school or your product company to get data from being kind of just a set of numbers in a table maybe to human readable data. Step one, find what's important to your people. And I use the word people very specifically here, not users. Users are users when they happen to be using your product, but they're always people. So ask yourself, what's important to them when they're using the product? Sure, it might be in a business context, but what's important to them as a human being? Maybe they're particularly concerned about what their boss thinks of them. You know, that's nerves. Maybe they're stressed out. Maybe they want to buy a really cool shirt and your data is going to help them do that. I don't know. Just ask the questions. When you find out what's important to your people, it tells you what kind of meaning you need to wrap your data in. Step two, prepare your palette, your data palette. As a painter, I want to be able to paint with as many colors as I possibly can to open up more and more types of stories that I can tell. Don't cut yourself off early by assuming you know what kind of data you need to display and what you can do with it. Take it all, but remember to do it ethically and responsibly. Step three, design a story, not a chart. Those charts are going to come in and really help you tell a story visually, but think about the story first. What kind of meaning do you want to string together? What do you want somebody to be able to do? And then build your charts after that to help support the story. And step three, validate the aha. All I know for designing with data for many years is that every time I think I've really got it down and I've got a universal story that everybody's going to understand, it's absolutely not true. Users find out a new thing to do with it, and I get to learn from that. So always validate your aha and watch your story evolve. It's a participatory sport. So with those four steps, you've really got what it takes to start working with human-readable data like a champ. So I'm going to encourage you today to be curious, have fun, and make something meaningful. Um, thanks so much for having me today and for listening. I will be around for questions if you want to talk about product design or data or this weird concept of human-readable data. And thank you so much. I'd like to call uh, my colleague Mala up here to talk about engineering. Hi everyone, I am Mala, I'm a software engineer here at SurveyMonkey, and today I'm very excited to share with all of you our journey of transforming SurveyMonkey's front end with GraphQL. So let's start by talking about 2019. 2019 was a pretty fun year for us here at SurveyMonkey, in part because we were able to completely reimagine um, our front end architecture. So what did this mean for us? Well, to start, we were able to work towards consolidating our numerous individually deployable and siloed micro webs into just a handful of apps built on React and Node.js. And we were able to introduce a very slim aggregation layer with GraphQL that sits between our front end and our back end collection of REST APIs, where all of our business logic and um, application logic are hosted. So today, I wanted to focus on the aggregation layer portion using GraphQL. But before I do that, I would love to get a gauge from the audience. How many of you have heard of GraphQL? OK, nice. How many of you have worked with GraphQL in any capacity? OK, not bad, more than I was expecting. Well, for those of you who haven't, 
GraphQL is simply a query language for your APIs. And so you can think of it as making it easier to build out your front end by providing a declarative way of fetching data without having to have knowledge of the entire system. And in that way, it kind of separates the back end from uh, innovation of the back end from the front end and kind of makes them completely independent. Um, in addition, graph, graph APIs are organized in terms of types and fields rather than endpoints. And so the client can get as many resources as possible in one single request to one single endpoint, or as I like to call it, one endpoint to rule them all. I did not come up with this, even though I think it's pretty genius, but I, so I think it's easy to see um, why GraphQL or the performance benefits that probably come from using GraphQL with this declarative and efficient type of data fetching. And spoiler, spoiler alert, it worked. So for the pages that we have today powered with GraphQL, we saw a huge reduction of payload and a huge reduction of data sent to the client and a huge improvement in our time to first interaction. This is a really big win for us and for all of our users of SurveyMonkey product. Okay, so now that we know that it works, let's talk a little bit about how it works. So we have our GraphQL client and our GraphQL server. At the center of our GraphQL server is our schema. And our schema is basically just the contract between our client and our server, um, telling the client how it can access the data. And it does this via API operations and data types. So the API operations can be read and write operations like queries and mutations, um, which are basically sort of top level entry points into the graph and data types like enums, scalars, objects, and the list goes on. Facades are then our functions, sorry, resolvers are then our functions that map our API operations to our backend services code. And so once we have our, our schema and our, our GraphQL server sort of built out, we can easily then build out our GraphQL client knowing what data is available to us and how it's available to us. And as we talk about building out our GraphQL client, it's also very important to talk about the amazing tooling ecosystem that GraphQL provides us. So at SurveyMonkey, we use GraphQL Playground, which is basically an in-browser IDE. And it allows me to hit my GraphQL server and build my queries directly in here in, in this tool and see my responses. And if I didn't have sort of of um, involvement in actually designing my schema. I have all of my schema details documented right here. So I have my queries and mutations that are available to me, my type details, what fields are nullable and non-nullable, and so much more. And so not only do we have an amazing performance benefit that we talked about earlier from GraphQL, but we also have an increased developer discoverability and productivity, um, especially from a front-end perspective, which is pretty exciting. So now that we have a little bit of context as to what the GraphQL server entails and some of the tools that we can use to build on top of it, let's dig a little bit deeper into building out our GraphQL client. Oh, okay. So say I was building out this My Surveys page and I wanted to fetch data that told me what surveys to render. Um, looking at my tooling and my schema code, I know sort of that I have some options and what's available to me. So I can start by building out my query. And this is just a simple query. Um, I have named my query for the purposes of debugging, uh, discoverability. And then as you can see, my, I pass in a argument, which is language ID, which we have set to be a non-nullable integer. And I pass that in as variables as well as impagination properties to my survey category's nested field. And under the hood, this basically dictates how my data is gonna be resolved and what data I get back. And then, as you can see, all I ask for in, the only subfields I ask for on items is ID and name, nothing more and nothing less. So I'm truly just asking for all I need. And as you can see from my response, the, the structure of this response mimics the structure of my query. And this is really great because I, get, I ask for something and I get predictable results back. Um, and, you know, one of the things to keep in mind as you're building out your GraphQL client is that at the end of the day, GraphQL can be driven by the data requirements of your products. And so the, the people who are building or the developers who are building your UI um, can have a little bit of that responsibility as to what, you know, how they get the data that is building their UI. 
Okay, so now that I have my query, how do I actually, or I've built out my query, how do I actually incorporate it into my front end? How do I incorporate it into my React application? So at SurveyMonkey, we use the Apollo client um, platform, which is basically just a GraphQL implementation, and it exposes me to a lot of cool things, one of which is um, my query component. And so I can basically pass in the query and variables that I wrote and built earlier as props to my query. I can also pass in this render prop function, um, which as you can see, exposes me to my various different query states, whether that's loading, error, and so on. And so based on my query state, I then can um, intelligently render my UI, which is pretty awesome. And one sort of um, best practice that we like to follow at SurveyMonkey when we're building our components and their respective queries is modularity, um, the idea of modularity and reusability. And GraphQL works very well with that because it allows me to co-locate my data with my components. The, the data requirements of my components can live right beside it. And that's important because if I needed to add fields, delete fields, delete a component, really make any sort of change, um, GraphQL, it, it, doing it this way allows me to do that. I don't have to worry about going up the component tree and having a query that basically powers multiple different components. I can just deal with the component at hand and the data that belongs with it. And another sort of application of this concept is component boundaries. So if I have a network error or error fetching my GraphQL data, rather than having my entire page fail or multiple components fail that are dependent on a particular query, all I have to worry about is gracefully degrading my components that are dependent on that query, which is great because this is a much better user experience. And so all of this is awesome, but this means that by default, every component will have to make their own network request. And we did just talk about how one of the selling points of GraphQL is minimal round trips. And so because of this, uh, GraphQL has actually come up with various ways to deal with this problem. Um, what we are currently using today is query batching. Um, <laughs> and that essentially allows all of my queries to be combined into one, um, one request. And this has advantages and disadvantages. There's alternatives to this, but we found, as of now, that this works for us because it allows us to think about modularity while still reducing the number of requests and kind of gaining that performance benefits from GraphQL. Okay, so from this example, I, I hope that it's easy to see why we at SurveyMonkey love GraphQL. I think A, our developers are happy um, because we have exposure to amazing tooling ecosystem. We have a predictable um, developer experience. Our backend engineers are also happy because we have, they can sort of iterate on their, um, on their code independently of sort of the new requirements that are coming in on the front end. My customers are happy because I have a performant, robust product. And if my developers are happy and my customers are happy, we have a really happy survey monkey. So with that, I wanted to say thank you so much. Um, we're really excited about what we're working on here at SurveyMonkey. So if any of this sounds exciting to you, please come hang out with me after and I'd love to chat. Thank you. So <clears throat> now we're going to have a little chat with some of our leaders here at SurveyMonkey about career topics. And so I'd like to welcome to the stage Mala. Not Mala. Just, Mala just left. <laughs> Shilpa, <laughs> Jing, and Erica. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, guys. So, um, so I have a few questions, but let's get started with introductions. So I'm uh, the CTO here at SurveyMonkey. I have been let's see, 30 years um, doing technology, and about 15 of those years, uh, last 15 years doing as an executive. And so um, I've managed everything from product program, engineering, QA, ops, I don't know, security, IT, all different types of uh, areas from companies as big as Adobe to companies that you've never heard of that are gone now. So uh, I just, I love, I love engineering, and I've been here at SurveyMonkey 18 months, um, and it's just been it's just been a really exciting journey. So, 
I think, uh, like, fun fact. Fun fact, uh, I used to play in punk rock bands. People will tell you this and laugh. Um, and uh, my, and also 25. This number is the metric I use to measure the number of engineering leaders I've created in Silicon Valley. I love coaching and mentoring uh, leadership skills for technologists and um, helping people grow into uh, leaders of technologists is one of my passions. So 25 in Silicon Valley. <laughs> So, with that, why don't we get started with some, some introductions to the other folks. Shilpa? Sure. Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Hi, I'm Shilpa. Um, I'm an engineering manager here at SurveyMonkey <laughs> uh, for the Respondent Experience team. Uh, and we're the team that manages and um, innovates on the survey taking page. Um, so it's the page you see when you take a survey. Um, and I've been at SurveyMonkey since I was an intern in 2012, so like just about seven years. Um, and uh, let's see, highlight of my career has been getting to move to Dublin for two years to set up the engineering t team there. And that's Dublin, Ireland, not uh, Dublin East Bay. Um, <laughs> and um, my fun fact is that while I lived abroad, um, I traveled to, I did 17 weekend trips to countries I'd never been to before. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jane Huang. Um, I'm a director of engineering, focusing on machine learning here at SurveyMonkey. I joined SurveyMonkey for three years. Fun fact, um, I did a hiking trip to Everest uh, Base Camp with a 14-day hike. hike. If you're ever hiking in high altitude, you'll know like, if you get a cold, it's devastating. I got a cold in day five. but. Luckily, I'm here, so I survived. <laughs> uh, I was able to complete the hike, and I was the highest point I was able to reach is more than 18,000 feet, which is something I get to blow up a lot. <laughs> right um, okay, so some highlights of my career. I studied robotics and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, after graduation, I didn't find a job in ML. That was like a decade, more than a decade ago within a prime time for ML, but I was able to work on different applications from network security appliances to cloud management to big data. And finally, I get the opportunity to work on ML here in SurveyMonkey, so that's where I am. Hello, good evening, I'm Erica Jader, and I'm the VP of product design. Okay. Mm -hmm. We had a joke in rehearsal that I wasn't even going to need a mic up so loud, and they turned mine off. That's a funny joke. Uh, I'm Erica Jader. I'm the VP of Product Design here at SurveyMonkey. I have been here two years. The baby's due August 1st. I thought I'd just get that out of the way so we could be done with the awkward, like, is she shiny? You know, anyway, um, highlight of my career was landing this job at SurveyMonkey. I know that sounds really cliche. I promise they're not paying me to say that. Tom, my boss, isn't here. But I think the reason why it stands out as such a highlight to me is not just because of the great role that it is, but actually what it represents in terms of me doing some things that were really out of character for my personality. So um, one was risk taking. Um, when I first um, <clears throat> kind of a, well, I don't know if I applied for the role, but when I first pursued the role, it was a really big step up for me in my career. I definitely did not meet all of the requirements in the job description, and so it was a big risk to kind of throw my hat in for it. Um, so, so I think that was one big piece. The second was intentionality. When I was starting my job search, I made a list of two, just two criteria that I absolutely must have in my next role, and I was really specific about looking for that and not settling for a role that had less, and then I think the third is patience, not my strong suit. Um, but uh, over the course of a couple of years, the first time I passed on SurveyMonkey, the second time they passed on me, the third time was a charm. So um, just a highlight of my career, just I think because of how I've reflected on what it says about me. Thanks, Erica. All right, so let's uh, start with some questions. How about we talk about your current work life and one of the things I think is really, really important is, is that for you to be successful, if you, don't in, if you don't, aren't really engaged in what you're doing, if you don't really like it, it's really, really hard to be successful because you're just not going to be excited about putting the effort in to, uh, that, that it really takes to make a success of yourself. So what I'm curious about is what is one thing you do in your job function that gets you really, really excited to come to work? 
And why don't we start with you, Shilpa? Okay. Uh, so I love coaching and mentoring people. Um, I love getting to know people and figuring out what their aspirations are, um, what skills they want to learn, um, where they want to take their careers, and kind of seeing uh, that progress being made over time. And I see every single day as a new opportunity to learn something new about someone on my team, um, mainly because people are complex and they change, and I just think it's an interesting problem. Okay. Jing, what about you? Um, so I mentioned I study robotics, and I was a sci-fi fan ever since I was a little. So I was always curious about how AI will shape our future. <laughs> and getting to work on machine learning here is just a dream come true. And we have like more than 40 billion people power data collected here in SurveyMonkey. So this is really a, a dream job. Erica? And for me, I think one of the things that I really enjoy about this role is a strength it plays to. Anybody familiar with the standout strengths assessment? It's a, it's a survey template you can use in our library. But anyway, um, they also didn't pay me to say that. Imagine that. Uh, I'm a connector. That's one of the strengths that always come, stands out for me. And I think that's something that I get to do a lot of in my role. So whether it's the day-to-day -day of connecting designers on my team with new challenges or mentors or growth opportunities, whether it's working with teams to find ways to connect teams um, with other teams that have similar products or project challenges, um, and of course, even in the nature of our product itself, which is about connecting our customers with their customers for feedback. I think it's just, a, it's a role that I really get to leverage the strength a lot, and that's really energizing for me. Thanks, Erica. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about your career journey? So one of the things that's really, really important is being able to advocate for yourself. So how have you guys advocated for yourselves throughout your career and what tactics have really been helpful in making you be heard? What about you? We'll start with you, Jing. Sure. Um, to be honest, I'm an introvert, so self-advocating wasn't natural to me. Uh, my pivotal point came when I realized self-advocating is not only about self, it's actually about like advocating for your team uh, it's also mutually beneficial for you and for your manager. So there are two tactics I want to share today I think will be helpful, um, and I, I think it was helpful. Number one is to do regular updates of your work progress. Doesn't matter if your manager asks or not, but do it. Um, you can do it through email, you can do it through your one-on-ones, but do keep those cadence. So that's that's just going to be mutually beneficial because I mean, your manager wanted to know your work. Um, and it, that's number one thing. Second thing is share your knowledge with your peer, with your cross-functional partners. Do tech talks, do long term learn, and when you grow senior, try to talk in conferences. This is also a mutual beneficial thing. It's self-advocating in one way, but it's also sharing your knowledge. Everyone else going to learn from you. So there are two things I want to share. What about you, Shilpa? <laughs> um, yeah, so for me, self-advocacy, um, it, I really, uh, it kind of, for me, it was a pivot when I realized that if you do it a little bit over time, um, it's much easier to have uh, important conversations when you really need to, so rather than kind of um, doing a, trying to do a big one all at once. Um, so the way in which I do that is, um, one, to um, just believe in myself. Um, I think if you believe in yourself, um, build confidence in, in your abilities, um, it trickles into everything you do. Um, two, um, I, it, understanding what your manager expects of you and meeting those expectations are just like, it's just easy points. Uh, that's not to say that you should feel um, restricted by those expectations, um, but um, I think that's kind of like a baseline. Um, and beyond that, you should kind of like what Jing said, uh, be giving regular updates about um, what you're working on. Um, and the third is um, really being able to articulate um, what value your, create, your work is creating for the business and for your team, um, and making sure that your manager understands that as well. Yeah, those are great suggestions. I, you know, it's funny. I, for me, one of the things I've noticed is, is that um, developing a, a very strong sense of entitlement which sounds negative, but I swear it's positive. <laughs> Developing a sense of entitlement that you are 
allowed to be in the room, especially for female technologists. I've noticed that this is an issue. I was fortunate in that I'm third generation technology leader in my family, so I didn't realize that you weren't supposed to, women weren't supposed to have a voice around technology. But I, as I've, I've noticed that it's really, really important that you feel entitled to speak up, that your voice is just as important as anybody else's. And if somebody interrupts you, interrupt them back. So, you know. <laughs> well said, well said. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right. <clears throat> Moving on. Uh, let's see. So mentorship. People talk a lot about mentorship, but it's, and what's interesting is some of the most influential relationships that you end up having, and the most, they're, because they're more common, are the allies that you develop in the workplace. And so I'm a little bit curious about, for you, Erica, tell me a little bit about some of the experiences you've had um, with allies. Well, it's an honor to have Robin Ducat ask me this question because she is one of my greatest allies here at SurveyMonkey, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. Um, I was actually trying to think of a really good example and I found the list was so long, I couldn't even remember the last names of half of the people that were coming to mind, which I think is, is either indicative of my memory or actually the nature of allies, which is unlike mentors, Allies are not big investments in relationships over time. It, they are episodic. They are based on a specific purpose at a specific place in time. And as a result, they can have a really, um, a, a, a much bigger impact on something you're trying to achieve at the time. And so, um, a good example that I thought of is in a previous role, um, I was a design leader of a, a smaller team, and one of my biggest challenges that I was facing was making inroads with our engineering leadership around the notion of the importance of front-end development, design systems, you know, some of the topics that um, design and leaders and engineering leaders often talk about. And um, I was having a lot of a hard time getting traction, and it was one of those tough problems because it was probably the most important thing to my team, and yet the thing I had the least direct control over. This was an example like I have to influence because I don't own the answer to the problem. And so uh, this particular ally was a new engineering manager that joined the organization. And in my initial just meet and greet with him, I learned that you know he had some expertise around developing front end teams and design systems and sort of an interest. And perhaps most importantly, I learned that he had a personal relationship with our CTO, who was the person I was having the hardest time making inroads with, that they were wasn't personal me. friends. It wasn't It me. wasn't, you know, it's a different, different story. I've got a lot of stories. Um, and so what I did is like, I really just started out by befriending this guy. I'm like, I'm going to make your transition into this company really easy. Like, I'm going to introduce you to people. I'm going to tell you all the secrets. You know, we had lunches, we had coffees. We started to build a relationship. And in a very short period of time, we were able to transition that relationship into finding a a mutually beneficial place where he, you know, he was able to leverage his expertise and his influence in the engineering organization to, to start a front end team. And I was able to give him disproportionately more resources and support from the design team to really prove the value and success of that. I think it's just a great example of an alliance that was very intentional but looked very different than a mentorship relationship because it was really about a place and a time and a need and a relationship right in that moment. Yeah, that's a wonderful story. I mean, I think that that's something that's really, really important. I know as an engineering leader, one of the allies that I always develop when I first join a company is the person who runs the customer support team, making sure that they understand that I am there to help them when we screw up because obviously the site does have issues on occasion. And so making sure that you have that relationship so that they support you when you screw, inevitably screw up and then you can support them. And so I, I just... You know, I've noticed this over the years that this is a pattern that really, really works. Um, so I do have a question. We are a in the sort of the center of the feedback economy. SurveyMonkey is, and I feel like feedback is one of the, one of the reasons I love working here is because I love data, I love feedback, I love learning new things uh, and it, driving insights from data. And so one of the things, though, I'm curious about is is that you know, feedback is so important in developing your career. What is some feedback that you've gotten, and we'll start with you, Shilpa, um, that have, you've gotten that really made a material impact on you? Yeah, um, it's really, it could be summed up in two words, uh, be reliable. Um, and no, that's not to say that I was unreliable, but you know, you like, 
you commit to something and it starts slipping and you don't tell the person that you told you would do it in time um, that it's slipping. Um, and so these, I, I don't know, these, these little habits that build over time, I think um, I kind of realized that um, you can be the smartest person and the most talented person in the room, but if they, people can't rely on you, they're, long term they're not going to want you to be on their team. Um, and so I think um, once I realized that, um, that kind of... Uh, just staying on top of things and making sure, even if I'm not going to complete something that I said I was going to, just communicating that out, um, it made my relationships and trust between um, colleagues a lot stronger. Um, and that was kind of a career shift for me. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, for me, probably, if I think of some of the, the best feedback I've ever gotten, um, uh, I have a lot of imagination and I like... Uh, organization structures and redefining things. And as a leader, I got the feedback from an executive coach some time ago that uh, you got to stop reorging every week. You got to stop. You got to stop all that shenanigans with the reorgs because people, you may like, you may be able to surf over the top of all of this change and this chaos, and you like change. But people, a lot of people like stability, and so stop. And it was really, really helpful to me because it helped me see the world slightly differently than the way I'd been seeing it. I was like, oh, but it's so exciting, all this change. And they were like, actually, you're killing people. So, you know, I think that um, uh, getting feedback and, and soliciting feedback and listening to it is really, really important, important part of developing your career. Um, so, advice for others. So, what skills and experience have been the most valuable to you in developing your career growth? Um, what would you give advice, what advice would you give to somebody if they wanted to turn a, to a career in tech? And uh, Jane, we'll ask you this question. Sure. Um, so when I, when I think of this question, I actually think it from a different angle, because tech, or the industry we're in, is fast growing, ever changing. So it is, it is not any like particular skill our experience that will determine our successful in this industry. Uh, it is what I believe is the growth mindset that we all should have and the willingness to learn new things and the courage to actually take on new challenge. Uh, I think if you have that, you will be able to learn. Just be sure that you actually enjoy doing tech at the first place, right? If, if you're sure with that and learn and you will be successful. It's just a time. Uh, one thing I liked about what Steve Jobs said, long pass. <laughs> this is an old, old sentence, but I think it always inspired me, is really you cannot look on how dots connected when you look forward. You only see the connections backwards. So when you see a new challenge, when you see a new opportunity, take it, do it, and you will, you will find how dots connected after some years. So Robin will know <laughs> better. Because I'm old, yeah. No, <laughs> lots of connections. Um, so I, I think one thing that's really important if you're thinking about a job in tech is, is that you, you have to like solving problems. As an engineer, that is your job. Your job is to come up with interesting and creative ways to solve problems. And if you don't like solving problems, if you think problems are pain, then you're not going to really enjoy being an engineer. So to Jing's point about start first to see whether, you know, basically this looks like an interesting career to you because if you don't enjoy it, if you don't enjoy solving problems, you're not going to enjoy being an engineer. Um, so with that, our final qu uh, question will take to Erica about finding the right company, the right place to work. What advice would you give to the women in the audience who are looking to change companies? Well, first, I'd say the recruiting booth is over there. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, I think the first question I'd ask is, why are you looking to change companies? Uh, are you running away from something or to something? I think it's really important to be true to ourselves and be really specific with ourselves when we start to think about making an important change like that. And start with the foundational assumption that there's no perfect job, there's no perfect company, there's only the right job and the right company for you right now. Um, and so I think, how do you get to that assessment? I always encourage people to start with a list of what are the top three most important criteria for your next role. You only get three. 
There's somebody in the, in the uh, audience I know I've interviewed recently, so she knows she's familiar with the question. Um, don't worry, she's joining. Um, anyway, I digress. But you know, start with your th three criteria, and then be really intentional about how you go out and look for a role that meets that criteria. As women in technology in the Bay Area, you know, m we all have the luxury of having recruiters hitting us up all the time, of going to events like this where hiring is a big focus. Talk to those people who are seeking you out, but but also seek out companies and people who you think are interesting or who you think might meet your criteria well. Have coffees, have lunches and casual conversations and you know, find that role that really speaks to what you're looking for. I often say that the best reason to look for a new job, not the only reason, but probably the best reason is because you're looking for a very specific type of growth or opportunity that your current company can't give you at this time and usually it's no fault of the companies that has to do with the size or the stage or the priorities. So have those specific criteria, be deliberate, and then go out and look for a job and do not accept a job that meets any less than two of your three criteria. Um, I think that, you know, just be really true to yourself there. And, and, and I think the last thing I would say in terms of advice here is to really be open-minded and flexible because after you've gone through that process, of thinking through your criteria, of talking to people, you actually might find that you look at your current company in a different lens, through a different lens, or see opportunities there in a different way. And it might be that right now that company is the place that meets your criteria the best. So just really be open-minded in um, that search and clear about what you're looking for and what you're running away from or running toward. Oh, that's, a, that's really, really great advice. Um, another thing I would also think about is that you are joining a group of people, and if you uh, don't like them, or if you don't <laughs> like the person you're going to work for, it doesn't matter how great the company is, your job's gonna suck. And so you really, and it's, they're really not gonna be a good advocate for you. If you don't connect with them, if you don't feel like they're somebody who's gonna really understand your deal and what's good and strong about you in particular, and they don't appreciate it, then find somebody else to work for. So that's my small piece of advice on, on uh, to finding companies to work for. Um, that is our last formal question. What we'd love to do is get questions from the audience. We are, I'm just wondering, do we have a mic we can hand around? Oh, all right. Bernice is over so, there with a the mic. Um, we have a question here. Hi, I'm Natalia. Hi, Natalia. Can I stand up? It's, everybody can see. I'm really curious about how you approach difficulty to make people feel in the survey. And we've already heard about like best practices, how to run great survey, but how to encourage people to look into it. Let me maybe ex also explain the question when, where it's coming from. Like five years ago, whenever I received the survey, I just filled it in because it was new and it was so cool. Now I receive surveys like in my career and then private ones and then like sometimes from my husband and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of them. So yeah, how, how do you make people start the survey? I think I'm gonna have Sarah, if she's okay with that, come up here and maybe answer that question just as our survey research expert. Yeah, Sarah, I got a mic for you. You thought you were getting away. <laughs> it's a little hard to hear over there. Can, do you mind repeating what you had to say? Oh, how to increase response rates? Right. Was that the question? Yes. So, how do you make people actually start the survey? Yeah. Because yes. You could be so many of them from various sources. Okay, that that's a really good question. So, a lot of people worry about response rates. So, there's a couple of things that you can think about. Number one, how are you inviting them? So how many of you guys, everyone, every workplace has this, has this type of person. So we utilize Slack here, so I'm sure you guys might utilize this. I hate it when someone slacks me and says, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're forced to say, hey, how can I help you? Um, 
I find that that's like one of my pet peeves. It's the same thing with survey invitations. If you just say, hey, take my survey, what's the incentive for anyone to actually take your survey? That's not engaging, that's not personalized, that's nothing, right? Um, so one, one of the things is to really think clearly about your invitation. Um, so it's best if you can customize it. So actually, utilize, if you know the person's name, utilize the person's name. If you can disclose what the survey is about, give a quick one sentence, not too long, again, um, description of what the survey is about. The other thing to remem remember is the first impression is the biggest impression that you can make. So again, thinking about the invitation, you don't want to use too much text because people are going to get overwhelmed and not read it. Same thing goes for the first question in your survey. So if you start with a really hard question, we actually see this in our, in our because um, we collect so many responses, we can actually go through our database and see what um, decreases response rates and what increases it. The first question is actually one of the most crucial. If you start with an open-ended question, which is really hard for people, because you have to type out your answer, your completion rate automatically drops on average around 15 percentage points. That's a lot. So if you just start with an easy question, even if it's like a soft opener that you kind of need to throw away, um, that's always best. Start with like a multiple choice easy question. So those are like two small things that you can do is number one, personalize what you, um, how you're inviting people in. And number two, um, make your first question easy. There's a lot of other things that you can consider like incentives, but that that's like a whole nother talk. So I'll, I'll save that for later. Um, I would also just add on that um, within the product itself, when you're creating a survey, um, there's a tool called Survey Genius that actually <laughs> <Thanks. tells> you, <laughs> <you're welcome. laughs> that tells you um, kind of scores your survey and gives you feedback on how you can improve response rates um, based on question ordering and length and all that. Yeah. Who's got the mic? Uh, sure. Bernice. Sure. I, I can yell. Can you hear me? <laughs> uh, my question is, if we're not necessarily sure, you know, our three criteria... Oh, sorry. I won't yell. All right. Um, if we're not necessarily sure what our three criteria are, what we want to do, how, you know, what we want, to, what we want our next step to be, how can we go about finding that next step and, and just kind of the general of what do you want to be when you grow up more? <laughs> yeah, I, well, we, we, we might, a couple of us might yeah. have thoughts here. I think my first thought is, like, don't try to make one of your criteria, like, this is what I want to be 20 years from now when I grow up. That's like this well thought through career that probably won't even exist 20 years from now, right? I think when I talk about criteria, I'm actually talking about really specific um attributes of your role. So for example, you know, one of my criteria when I was joining SurveyMonkey was I had a 10 month old at home. I knew that eventually I was going to want to have another child and I knew that I was going to work a lot of hours no matter where I went. So I knew commute, short commute was super important to me. And so like one of my two was short commute. Right. And again, so it doesn't, you know, I think it's about what is important to you in your life right now. If you're earlier in your career, you might say, you know, what I really like is I'm a really outgoing person and I really get a lot of energy from talking to people. So if I don't know what function I want to be in, I know that it's super important to me to have a role where I interact with people for more than half of my day. Right? And then you can start having the conversations and like, you know, you'll find out which roles actually fit that criteria and which don't. But don't start out with like, I must be in sales or I must be a, a front end engineer or, you know, like trying to get too specific about the career path. I think that will emerge for you as you think about what kind of work or environment gives you energy and you're passionate about. Right. One thing I, 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 I think I can add on is when you really don't know what you really like on, I think when I was, I don't know, when I was in school, this is a question, right? But look at what are, what are the opportunities that are out there. Try to do them, right? You, you can't always think about you like or not, but that's just thinking. You have to do it and actually testify if you actually like it or not. So don't pass an opportunity thinking you may not liking it. If there's an opportunity, actually catch it and try to do something about it. Experiment. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Hi. Um, so my question is, um, how do you solicit constructive feedback? So 
I find, personally, I find like asking directly, it's not the most effective way. And actually, I've been thinking about sending out a survey. <laughs> um, so um, I'm wondering if you have any insights. Well, we're running a, a feedback survey right now in engineering, and <clears throat> anonymous is good. If you really want to find out if you're trying to, st for an organization or for a, a something that you're doing, um, anonymous is good. If it's personal, if you're trying to get feedback from people personally, you just have to show that you don't, it, it takes time to get people to trust you, that you won't freak out. So ask for feedback, and it's still too sugar-coated, poke a little, have it be a little less sugar-coated, poke a little less sugar-coated not reacting, just keep asking questions. And then people will start being willing to give you the kind of feedback that you really need because you need them, you need people to believe that you can handle it, right? So that's why people sugarcoat things because they don't want to deal with people's emotions when they upset them. So present yourself as somebody who is just interested in the facts and it really, really helps. I think another trick I've um, called out for some of the folks on my team, I've had, I've had people reporting to me who are like the type of people who just always get positive feedback. Like, oh, every time we send the anonymous peer feedback 360 survey, everybody says they love working with me. And there's, and, and, and by the way, that's true. And that means that you're great and you should feel really good about that. But obviously it's not as constructive. Um, so I think there's a couple tricks. One is ask a different level of person for feedback. So perhaps you're asking people who are your current peers, not the people who you would like to be your peers in your next role, right, in terms of like thinking about asking the next level. The other thing is asking the question in a different way. So rather than saying, you know, let's just say, you know, your ambition is to be a more influential leader, like rather than asking somebody, well, you know, what, um, you know, what room for improvement do I have or some sort of generic question, ask like, hey, you know, I'm really focused on trying to have more influence as a leader. What are some areas where you think I could be more influential or I could, what could I do differently to have more influence? So really ask about the thing that you have identified as the thing you want feedback on specifically as opposed to just general feedback questions. Yeah, I've noticed that if you, and also real-time feedback. So you're in a meeting and you know the meeting's over, asking the person, hey, do you think that that thing I said in the meeting was okay? You know, that kind of, where, where you're right there in the moment and they might be more inclined to give you feedback because they, you just had this experience. It's hard also for people to remember if you're asking things that are too general. So it might be another thing that could help you. Okay, we've got a question back there in the orange. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you again for organizing this. I have used SurveyMonkey for many years for my own events. I used to be in marketing, so thanks for this opportunity to see you in person. So I used to be an engineer who moved into marketing, product management, sales ops, kind of seen all the 360 of the business. And one of the comments... Uh, Robin made around problem solving. That one aspect that I learned in engineering has stayed with me throughout my career. So I just wanted to say that to the audience and also to anybody who is in tech, if you don't like problem solving, then your career, you know, you, you basically are lost. Uh, so the one question I have is, in engineering especially, you know, given that I've done everything, I'm realizing now if I wanted to come back, what sort of strategic leadership roles could one aspire to? Is that even possible? You mean, you mean you want to move laterally from where you are, the level that you're at now, back into engineering? Yes. Yeah, I'm so probably you'd have to go join engineering at the level that you left, not the level that you are. Um, just because the engineering leadership, usually you, you need to have the respect of the engineering the engineers that are working for you, and that means having been sort of through the ranks of, of leadership and engineering. At least that's been my observation. So if you're willing to go back and, and sort of, if you left as an engineering manager, joining as an engineering manager again and working your way up, I think that that's, that, at least that's what I would 
would guess, unless you go to a startup. A startup, everything's possible, right? You can be a CTO at a startup with a, you know, an accounting degree. Like, it's totally fine. <laughs> just, just write some code. So, I mean, and, and sometimes I'll tell people that. Like, this, you know, you get somebody who's like, I want to be a CTO now. And I'm like, well, go join a startup. You can do that. <laughs> Knock yourself out. Um, so, anyway, I digress. But that, that, so I think that if you really want the leadership role early, then, yeah, startups are great for that. I have a question. So, ha, 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 what if you like what you're doing, but you just don't like the people you're working with? <laughs> Get a new job. <laughs> Get a new job. <laughs> yes, we got recruiting over there. <laughs> no, I, my life is too short, man. Like, if you hate the people you work with, get a new job. You're not going to be able to fix them. I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't know if somebody has a more, more um, sophisticated answer than that, but... <laughs> I'm going to abstain. <laughs> Hi there. Um, my name is Vidya. Um, Fantastic to be here and see all these women and uh, the panel here. It's been um, great. Uh, Robin, my question's for you. It's, it's great to see a female CTO. Sure. Um, my world is full of the other gender, so it's really <laughs> nice that seeing this. Um, can you talk about your journey? And you said you've been in tech for 30 years. And um, what were your... Pivotal moments when you look back now, you said, "Okay, this is this was a game changer." Or, oh wow, I'm sure you have a few. <laughs> oh boy, um, <laughs> you know, I was really lucky. I, like I said, I was, you know, my mother ran a huge research team at MIT, so I didn't know. I didn't know. I I didn't know. I was, but women weren't supposed to be engineers. I, nobody told me that. And so, um, and I also liked being an outsider. I was a punk rocker, and so you know, I didn't mind being the only engineer, female engineer in the room. And again, didn't didn't realize I wasn't supposed to be there because nobody told me. And and uh, and I didn't mind being an outsider. So I was really really lucky. Um, uh, but I think that that along the way, um, things I had to learn that were hard to me when I when I realized that. Um, after getting into fights with more than one boss over multiple companies, realizing that it was me, that um, it wasn't them, it was me, and that I had to work for people that I liked and who understood my special snowflake self. And, and, uh, and so I think that everybody's got a certain set of strengths and weaknesses, right? And so over the years, developing um, a career around my strengths and then hiring for my weaknesses. So it's not one specific story, it's just sort of a constellation of experiences that have led me to believe that, you know, if you focus on your strengths and hire for your weaknesses, you can actually be really, really successful. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, it's kind of a long, windy answer to that, because I don't really have uh, specific things that come to mind. It's like, oh my God, that time when, um, there have been moments in time of pieces of advice I've gotten, um, because I, I will, have a street fight about about things. I got the advice once of Robin. Sometimes you just got to keep your head down, keep your head down, and just keep moving. And all those people that you want to kill, they'll be gone, and then you'll still be there. And then you get to run the show. And so, <laughs> so, and the guy who gave me that advice is my boss here. But I worked for I worked with him 20 years. I mean, we've been working together on and off 20 years. So that was a long time ago. It was great advice. Um, so anyway, there's been l lots and lots of uh, little experiences that have brought me where I am, but I, but I do think focusing on your strengths and being resilient, you know, you're going to get your ass kicked every day. Just keep showing up, you know. Um, I, that's been my experience. So I, again, like I said, I liked being an outsider, so I didn't really mind. I, I always thought like, oh, this is my fight to have. But if you, but I, what I'm realizing, and what I've come to realize as trying to help other women move through, there's not, not everybody likes being an outsider. Not everybody like, everybody, you know, not everybody wants to have that fight. And they shouldn't have to, right? You shouldn't have to have that fight. That shouldn't be part of the deal. You should just be able to be a a woman in tech and not have it be a big deal. It kind of annoys me actually sometimes. So like I feel like I'm a prize pool that's being trotted out of, you know, oh, female technology leader. But, but I, because I want that to be the norm, I want that to be, everyone can be a CTO and be female. It's not, a, it's, it's like, that's not a thing. But we're not there yet. I recognize that. So that's just my long-winded answer to your question. Sure. 
Hi. My question uh, is survey monkey consider yourself like Uber in survey industry if not or oh yes what is your major competition do we, uh, do we consider ourselves to be Uber the Uber of surveys and who is our major competition <laughs> We are the Uber of surveys oh yes <laughs> oh yes <laughs> um, so it depends on what market actually, who our biggest competitors are. It depends on whether it's the, um, you know, consumer market, and sort of low-end surveys, basic surveys, and you have Google Forms, and you have, you know, things like, uh, oh, I don't know, Typeform. Type yeah, that's what I was thinking of, Typeform. Let's see how much I worry about them. Um, and then at the, at the high end in market research, you'd have Qualtrics. But uh, one of the things I love about SurveyMonkey is, is that our product works for all of these markets, for the big and the small, and that's actually what makes us unusual. Um, Typeform doesn't work for market research, and Qualtrics doesn't work for the basic user. So, um, but yes, we are amazing. I totally think that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I had a question. I actually had the reverse question of someone here who... Uh, uh, asked a question. So I, uh, my name is Angelica and I've been in the tech industry for about 10 years now. Uh, I've been fortunate to have a very supportive boss and team. Um, my situation is I don't really like what I'm doing anymore. It's a short glass ceiling where I'm at and there's not really a, a lot of room for growth or advancement. So just um, asking for, you know, anyone's opinion about, you know, being in that kind of situation um, having a supportive team and a supportive boss, but not being, not really being happy with what you're doing. I think we call that the curse of being too comfortable, or so, something like that. I, you know, I, 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 again, I, I started with the there is no perfect job, there's no perfect company, and so I think it depends where you are in your life, right? Like, I think you might be at a point in your life where you're like, these are the years where I want to work hard and I want to charge ahead and I'm willing to pay the price to do that and therefore, like, staying in a role where you know that there's no growth for you is probably not a good idea. You might be at a stage in your life where you're like, you know what I need? I need to feel supported. I need to like, I need to feel happy going to work every day because of the people I'm working with. And, you know, at this stage right now, maybe actually climbing that ladder is not my top priority. So I think it really depends where you are. But I think if you are at a place where growth is important in terms of your personally, and, that, and you recognize that that is not what you have at this company. Well, I guess the first question is, are there other roles within the company where you could find growth and, if, you know, and other avenues to explore there? And if not, then, you know, it, that's probably the right time to start looking at what else is out there. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, thank you very much for sharing your advice today. Um, so I came from a finance marketing background and being a Bay, obviously tech is where it is. So I want to know what's your perspective on boot campers as well as if you have any advice for reframing other industry experience for transitioning into tech. Thank you. I have some thoughts about this, but I don't know if you guys want to share your... I, I think that if you... Boot camps are um, typically really, really great feeders for small startups and um, uh, tend to be less effective for getting uh, jobs at larger companies who have big internship programs, but startups usually don't, and so they're very excited about taking um, uh, boot camp uh, folks. And so I've worked at all different size companies, and that's been the pattern, is, is that typically small companies eventually grow out of the boot camp um, uh, feeder, um, just because there is a lot more risk, and so as companies get big, bigger, they'll take the CS degrees from, you know, their intern programs um, as the feeder, as the sort of feeder into the um, into sort of the low-level um, uh, engineers. But um, I, I love startups. I love I, the experience you get at startups is amazing. So I think that going through a boot camp and ending up at a startup is an amazing way to start your technology uh, journey. So uh, one thing I think of like your background in finance, right? Cross-functional, if you think about what tech today, right? Having a knowledge of a different industry is actually very valuable. Like taking tech apply for finance. Think about, what, for example, data science. There's a lot of, it's a big application on data science for finance. So those are areas where you actually have a unique strength. 
to segue into tech if that's what you want to do. Uh, everybody heard about the bro culture in Silicon Valley. So is there the thing in SurveyMonkey or any other job you had before? And how do you deal with it? How you handle situations like mansplaining or competing for a role, climbing a ladder? No. So mansplaining? Sarcasm. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> what about the career ladder? But for a career <laughs> ladder, I mean, well, SurveyMonkey does not have a bro culture. It's actually one of the wonderful things about SurveyMonkey. I guess, do you guys agree with that? Yeah, I think that's one of the things that actually was a little bit interesting, a transition for me when I joined, was this that didn't have to have that kind of, uh, didn't have to whip out the sarcasm quite as <laughs> frequently. Um, but... Um, but I think from the career ladder, I think it's really just important to advocate for yourself and just keep men ask. I always asked, always, every single promotion I've ever gotten, I asked for. Every single one. It's not because they didn't think I was good. It's just that, you know, people pay attention to people who are asking. And so that would be the thing that I would, I would say this is that, that um, the bro culture thing, I don't know. I don't know what to do about that, right? I just, I mean, tell them to knock it off and move on um, and uh, I don't know if I you guys have a, tech. getting I think that's actually the, the best way to solve for it as if you're a, if you're a leader is to bring more women in and it just kind of it gets diluted and 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 I don't know slows down um, but as an individual what doesn't have the power to change it um, it you know if the company is is really obnoxious and doesn't fit your cultural values then maybe look for some other place um, but um, also just tell people to knock it off it's my favorite thing to do. Um, but, may, you know, whether you feel comfortable doing that is really sort of your, your thing. But as for career growth, um, you really have to, to just keep... I mean, one of the things that Jing mentioned, which is so important, is making people aware of what you're doing. Just making sure that whether that, that your, their competency is visible. Um, and uh, whether it's tech talks, speaking, things like that, so that people become aware of your value to the organization. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but yeah. I don't know what to say about the actual bro culture. I mean, to fix it, it's mostly, yeah, just bringing more women in and, and, and not tolerating it when people are obnoxious. So. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Olga. So my question is about technical excellence. Uh, so whenever you come as a technical lead or an architect to the company, uh, to the new company, you always have to prove yourself. Uh, and unfortunately, I am doing uh, uh, my engineering for over 15 years. Uh, I build systems that always run whenever I leave the companies. Uh, but still, like five years ago, when I joined Salesforce, uh, I had to prove myself by designing this complex system and building it myself. Uh, then people realized like, what I really was uh, and was very surprised that I did this. And unfortunately, I do the same at Google right now. I still have to prove myself uh, and like building this complex system and designing this myself uh, because I find that like people, maybe they trust me, but they don't trust as much as I would like. And I see they trust some other people. They, they just not the same uh, kind of uh, expertise and uh, um, the same kind of the bar that they expect from the technical lead. Uh, and I was wondering, is it going to happen at all the companies? It's just like whenever you join like any new, this is what happens and you try to stay at the same company for longer or it's, uh, there is some other skills you can do so you can prove without like building this complex system, like writing the code yourself. Um, yeah. I think storytelling is a gift that it takes, it's useful to develop. Um, I'm not sure if you guys agree with this, but I, I think that one of the challenges, and I don't think this is a male-female thing, actually. I think this is a, maybe an introvert-extrovert um, thing. Um, you'll, you'll get uh, people who are just really good at telling their story 
at selling, selling themselves. And so these are skills you can develop, storytelling, selling skills, being able to tell the story of the things you've done in the past um, and, um, and being confident about it, feeling a sense of like, you know, being entitled to be in the room and, and telling your story is really, really an important skill that will shortcut some of that. I think in engineering though, engineering tends to be a show me kind of culture. So it's, a, it's this intersection of being able to talk about technology and learning how to tell the story of all the things you've done in the past um, uh, so that people will listen. And telling it in a way that they will listen, not the way that you want to tell the story, but the way that they will hear it. Um, so you can definitely get coaching um, in that specific area if it's something that you're finding frustrating. I mean, some of it is just when you start a new company, you do have to tend to prove yourself a little bit, right? That's just sort of part of it. I don't know if you guys have some thoughts about that. I would totally agree. Um, I mean, I was an engineer developer myself. Like I said, self-advocating wasn't natural, right? Same thing for you, like if you want to, it, it just feel like we need to do the work to prove ourselves. Uh, but in a lot of cases, like we have peers or our male peers, are, they came to them more naturally where they just be able to tell the story about the work they have done. Instead, they have to build something again and again, doing the same job to prove what we already been able to do, right? Um, so learn the skill to really be able to sell your story, self-advocating. Uh, if that come, doesn't come naturally, like Robin mentioned, get some coaching, uh, really just improve that set, be confident, yeah. Yeah, and strategically placed solving other people's problems um, also becomes a story that people will tell about you. So sure. one of the th ways that um, when I was still writing a lot of code, I would come in and help somebody solve a problem that they were having. And <clears throat> you do that enough, then people, people will trust you with, um, without you having to be you know, designing something from scratch and building a whole up system, but being, being able to troubleshoot their systems. Um, because if you're good at writing a system, if you, you, know, if you can really build a, a, such a system from scratch, then you might be able to help somebody else fix theirs. And helping people fix their problems makes you very, very popular. Very popular. <laughs> so. Wait, wait, what's going on back there? Microphone. So, Hi. Uh, uh, hello. First of all, thank you for sharing your experiences <laughs> as uh, inspiring technology leaders. So, looking at, back at your career journey, um, what was the best decision you made and the worst decision you made, and why? <laughs> it's a, such a hot question. <laughs> um, I, I, don't try and get your boss fired. <laughs> don't try and get your boss fired. It does not work. Even if, they, even, if, even if they suck and they deserve to be fired, don't try and get them fired because compl com complex. Yeah. How about that? Uh, Jing, you got something more? Uh... Um, I couldn't think of any like, like really worse decision you could make. I think every decision, there, there is different perspective, right? There's different outcome, yeah. um, but there's always a way out, and that's like the, I, I think of that's an opportunity instead of anything really, nothing, nothing really bad could happen. Uh, either you're going to stay with a job or you leave for another company. It's a, it's a choice. It's an opportunity that you will make because of your decision. There's nothing really bad going to happen. Yeah, it's actually interesting. It's the most important thing is how you get back up. If you, so take risks and <clears throat> you're going to fail. That's okay. You learn, you only, I mean, in my experience, you learn from failure, not from success. So take everything as a learning experience and get back up and right. do it again. So I don't know. I've had a, so many learning experiences um, that have helped me learn. Okay, we are at 8.30. Holy mackerel. <laughs> We have, okay, we so have one, one, more, one more question right here, I guess, and then we'll... we'll uh... I'm actually looking for an advice. So imagine a manager, kind of experienced, outsider, looking for a new position, and uh, this manager, let's say me, uh, uh, I find a position in a company that I really admire, and I look through this qualification, and I look through this job uh, responsibilities, and I know that I'm going to excel at this job but all of this 
preferred qualification may not match what you actually have in resume. So how to, ex how to grab this attention, how to break through, how to be noticed by a, as a recruiter or hiring manager when you apply to this job? I mean, the question is, is so you have, you, have, you have the qualifications, but your resume doesn't illustrate that you have the qualifications? Some specifics, for example, when it is... Uh, yeah, what's an example of a specific, a specific programming language or something? Uh, yeah, either like a particular experience or like, let's say experience in networking or experience of working with healthcare, for example. You know, it's funny, I mean, men will just apply. You just apply. Right. <laughs> I mean, like, like, this is one of the things that we talk about with when we, we actually, when we create job descriptions, um, we're really careful to make them so that they're inclusive, that they're, that, that, that women are not going to automatically exclude themselves because there's too much specificity in them. Um, and so it, if you, if you reduce the amount of specificity, then you're, you're going to get a wider um, range of people because re the reality is, is that you don't really know what you want exactly. You write a job description and then people show up and you're like, oh, hey, I kind of like you. And you really don't match the job description exactly, but you have something that's special that will really resonate with the team. So apply anyway. Sorry, I can't hear yeah, you. Yeah, I think how to stand, how to stand out. Um, I, one thing I'll take on that is, uh, I mean, the reality of depend, you know, depending on where you're applying, most companies the the resumes that are coming through the application system are being reviewed by the recruiters, and the recruiters, while great partners to the hiring managers, they know what they're supposed to look for based on the resume, and so if it doesn't match, you're much less likely to get passed on. Uh, doesn't mean you shouldn't apply and you shouldn't go through the recruiter. I think it's a yes and um, figure out how to get in to a company, how to talk to real people, how to, you know, network. Again, I think it's a lot harder if you, if you reach out to, you know, like let's say you were interested in a design manager role on my team, which ho hopefully you're not because then this will become awkward. But like, <laughs> let's just say, you know, you reach out to me and you're like, I really want to be considered for the role. Um, you know, can we, can we talk? I might look at your resume and go like, mm, uh, I'm not sure, right? But if you reach out to me and say, hey, your experience looks really interesting. I'd love to pick your brain. Do you, can I buy you a coffee? I might be like, oh yeah, okay, maybe, maybe yeah. And then while we're having coffee, you might somehow slip in the fact that like, oh, actually I'm looking for a job. You know, would you ever consider somebody like me? Again, hopefully I didn't just play out some future scenario that we're gonna have because that'd be really weird. But, um, you know, I, I think it's like, if you come at it from, I'm a job seeker, I'm a job seeker, I'm a job seeker, you know, you might find people are, that's not the best way to build the relationships. But, you know, talking to, people in the organization and finding your way through is how you're going to stand out. It either because your resume looks exactly the same as everybody else's or not quite the same as everybody else's. See if you can find out who the hiring manager is and then use LinkedIn to see if you're connected to them. I mean, that's probably the most um, straightforward way to uh, sort of do it and around the process. Yeah. Yeah, LinkedIn is your friend. Okay, we are being kicked off the stage. Thank <laughs> you through. so much, and please enjoy the rest of the evening.